Um, our next um, panel, um, so our next panel is going to be on corporate tax abuse, um, as the sign behind me says. Um, so I have uh, the honor of introducing our moderator, Severine uh, Picard, and if you could all welcome um, our moderator and panel, thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the lunch and the uh, world famous uh, Eclair au chocolat. I certainly did. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here and to moderate uh, this panel. My name is Severin. I'm the head of Progressive Policies, which is a consultancy specialized in labor rights and industrial relations. But above all, and for many years, I've been a trade unionist. Um, I coordinate a network of unions active on tax justice. This network is fairly recently established, but we already have a membership of 80 trade union members coming from 34 countries across four continents. So it really has a global um, outreach. And the objective of this network is to bring workers together uh, to um, uh, help facilitate uh, campaigns for international tax reforms that's going to bring some benefits uh, for workers. We have a particular focus on corporate income tax um, because we um, have first-hand experience of the adverse impact of corporate tax dodging um, unemployment. Now, when the organizer asked me to provide a few words of context for this panel, I was taking my notes together and then suddenly realized that about six years ago, I was asked to give a presentation at the OECD Inclusive Framework on the labor perspective on international taxation rules. Six years ago. And today I could make exactly the same speech with the same concerns and the same demands. So when I made that speech six years ago, it was just at the beginning of the BEPS 2.0 negotiations. We didn't have as such pillar one and pillar two. There have been many, many meetings, many G20 statements, many more invitations and impact assessments to which we didn't have access. But a lot of work happened in six years. And yet nothing or very little has changed from our perspective. Our concerns have not addressed. The only thing that has changed is that in the space of six years, the awareness and the frustration from workers is actually on the increase. Now, the impact of corporate tax avoidance on employment is multiple. Um, we feel, first of all, we feel that impact as um, uh, citizens, as users of public services, Corporate tax dodging has a very severe impact on public budget. It means less public services. It, may, it means less investment, public investment into sustainable growth. It means more austerity, which is something that scares quite a lot of us. But we also, a, a bad taxpayer, we also say that usually it is a bad employer. Where, as a corporation, you engage in profit shifting, what you do is that you take the cash away from the workplace, away from the workers are, and you hide it in tax havens, in low tax jurisdictions, where it's going to benefit no one but a chosen few. And so those corporations that engage in aggressive tax planning also have tremendous problem negotiating better wages, higher employment levels, better working conditions with their workers, simply because they are maintained artificially in a poor financial health. And so some of our speakers today, uh, Margarita in particular, is going to present her finding on tax avoidance and overall employment levels. So it really is going to give us an insight um, on this aspect. And John, um, pronouncing your name the French way, even though it, you're Portuguese, um, is going to present to us the perspective, um, the employment perspective, but from a low tax jurisdictions approach. And I think the message that you want to send us today is that this famous trickling down theory, according to which when you attract foreign capital is going to benefit the whole society, it's probably not working as well as it was pretending to. Now, we, the labor movement, we are very much aware of the close connection uh, between corporate power tax avoidance and inequalities. As we know, a very large driver of inequalities is where capital 
enjoys a much bigger share of global income than labor. Now, to give you a concrete example, in France, trade unions have long been negotiated what we call financial participation. Financial participation is where your employer is doing really well, has a very good profitable year, largely thanks to your work as an employee. Then you are, auto, you are entitled to receive a percentage of that very profits, of, that, of those profits, and that adds up to your remuneration. Now, a recent study has estimated that where your employing company is part of a large multinational with a series of establishments and head offices outside France, that study estimates that the right to financial participation decreased on average by 37%. So 37% of financial participation, less if you are employed in a multinational with several activities outside France. What does that tell us? It could tell us that multinationals are not profitable, that they're not making any money, and so no financial participation. Yeah, that, that's possible. I suspect that another possibility is that the bigger you are as a multinational, the more capable you are to put in place artificial structure to shift your profits away from France where they can no longer be shared with the workforce. And that to us is a strong driver for, as I said, um, inequality. So we have two fantastic speakers um, that are going to talk to us about the relation between corporate power and tax and what can be done about it. Uh, Camille is going to talk to us from the perspective of big tech, I think, in particular. And then Ines is going to make the case for an excess profit tax, um, which um, in many ways, I think you can regard that as a tax on economic rent. So a very rich panel. Um, I'm going to stop here and um, give the floor to the speakers. So the first one on the list, I've lost my list. I think it's Jean. Yes, so Jean, you're, you're the first one. So Jean, you are a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow, uh, fellow at Queen Mary University of London and an assistant professor at the University of Lisbon. And you're going to present your paper called Treasure Island's Real Job question mark. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for the opportunity to present this, um, this work. As three of the, of, of the co-authors are researchers at, at Bank of Portugal, I have to point out that every, ev from everything that I'm going to say, for everything that I'm going to say, the usual disclaimers apply. Um, so, while there are now a few very good uh, papers studying the impact of uh, low tax jurisdictions on high tax countries, and they have done that for a series of outcomes that we describe here, less is known about the impact, less is known about what happens in these low tax jurisdictions. The general perception, fooled by the lack of transparency, is that in most of these areas there could be just mailboxes with very few workers, with very few tangible assets, and so on. So it, perhaps in response to this general perception, in the recent years, um, several of these uh, low tax jurisdictions have introduced some substance requirements um, that with the idea that having a few physical content, so physical uh, employees who are physically present in these areas, that there could be uh, more uh, room for development and growth in these areas. Um, and we have several examples of these. In, there are several usual suspects like the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and so on and so forth. They have all recently introduced these type of requirements. So in this paper, what we try to do is to try to describe how is the labor market in a low tax jurisdiction that is located in the EU so I will very briefly run through a characterization of works, workers and firms in this area. And I will try to point out if there is a wage premium for workers, conditional and observables, are they getting a wage premium vis-a-vis -vis other workers that have exactly the same characteristics but are working for other types of um, uh, firms in other areas. Afterwards, we will rely on the fact that there were some substance requirements introduced in the middle or in the during our sample period to try to understand what happened to workers. 
through, uh, uh, after these uh, substance requirements were introduced. And we tried to answer these questions for those workers who were, were already there and for workers who moved to this low tax jurisdiction. And we will answer all of these because we have access to very good uh, micro level data. So we know all the firms that are located in one uh, low tax jurisdiction and we are able to merge this information with a linked employer employee data set where we have information about workers, education levels, wages and so on and so forth. So the this case study that I'm presenting is the case study of the Madeira's free trade zone. So Madeira is a small island in the south of Portugal. Um, um, so the, 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 um, this low tax jurisdiction was introduced in the 1980s. And the idea or the main purpose was to compensate for structural handicaps that exist in these peripheral regions. So it was negotiated with the European Union and so on and so forth. And um, before 2012, all firms that were registered in this uh, in this jurisdiction, they had, they had, didn't have to pay um, corporate income tax. Uh, that changed in 2012, so they are now paying 5% corporate income tax. And throughout the period, there were some tax exemptions that were uh, implemented. So they, these firms, they don't have to pay taxes on dividends. Uh, payments of royalties, interest, and other types of services. In 2011 and 12, what happened? There was a, a, a reform that introduced substance requirements in this area. And not only, as I said, the corporate income tax rate increased from 0 to 5%, but there were some job creation requirements that depended on the amount of profits that were declared in this area. And we, in the table, you can see how, how many jobs you need to have, you need to report in order to be able to um, report this type of uh, profits. So the first question very quickly, are these firms very different from what we observe? So what happened to the number of firms there? So there were about 3,000 firms in 2009, so before the reform. Then with the introduction of these substance requirements, many firms left, but those who stayed, the, the, the number of firms that had at least one paid employee, it increased by about three times. Um, these firms are very different. So I'm comparing here in, uh, so the, the, black, the black columns are the ones that have uh, Madeira Free Trade Zone. I'm comparing with the average firm in Portugal. And as you can see, they are multinationals uh, and they report turnover that is not very comparable with the average Portuguese firm. What about workers? So the number of workers, there were about 1,800 in 2009, and they almost doubled in 10 years. Who are these workers? So they tend to be very educated workers, but the percentage of very educated workers declined a little bit with the substance requirements. What changed also dramatically is the percentage of workers that are now starting to work in part-time jobs. In Yes, in this very few low tax jurisdiction. Okay, it's a small one for which we have very detailed data. Who are these workers? So they are accountants, lawyers, but we also have office workers, some real activities being there, and some company directors, and so on and so forth. So then the question is, is there a wage premium for the workers who are there vis-a-vis -vis the other workers who are in the average firm in Portugal? So this is very, so a, a simple correlation would tell you that yes, there is a wage premium, but the composition of these workers is very different in these areas. So we try to run these regressions or these comparisons by including as much observables as we have, and we do have a lot of observables with respect to education and type of firm and so on and so forth. And the result seems to be persistent throughout that there is a wage premium for a worker with the same type of ability, with the same type of education and so on, uh, from the same age group and so on and so forth that works in that firm vis-a-vis -vis a similar worker that works uh, for a non-low um, tax jurisdiction. Well, then what I'm going to do is to analyze what happened to workers. So this is throughout the sample period. So from 2009 to 2019. Okay, but as I said in 2010, 11, and 12, there was this introduction of substance requirements. And what happens to workers? What happens to the wage premium in this case? 
So let me first focus on the workers that were already there, the incumbents. So in this exercise, what I'm going to do, so I do need the comparison group. So what I'll do is I will select workers between 25 and 55, and then I'll try to find some clones in the pretreatment in 2010. I will try to find the clone that is as comparable as possible in terms of education, uh, age, structure, nationality, and so on and so forth. And then I will compare the evolution of these, uh, the performance in the labor market of these workers with their clones before and after the introduction of the of the substance requirements. And what we find, we find that there is an increase in the wage premium for these workers that were there. So it's uh, about 10% of increase in their wages. And this happens because they were able to uh, look to start working in more firms. So they started working in more firms as part-time jobs. So they were able to, by being there, they were able to um, look for better opportunities. What happens to those workers that, uh, were, uh, that move there in search of better positions? So I compare all workers who move, but I'm comparing workers who move to this low tax jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis workers who move to other areas. And in this case, we do not find a big premium. W what we do find is that they tend to work less hours than they used to work. Okay. So just to conclude, so what we try to do in this paper that I tried to present very briefly, so we try to examine what happens to a labor market of a treasure island. And we try to understand, we first try to describe uh, what are, who are these workers, who are these firms? Do they get more money than, than, the, than workers that are similar in other areas? And then we use the fact that there was an introduction of a substance requirement in this period. And we show that wages increased for those who were there, that they were able to um, uh, use the fact that they were there, their connections, their, the information about the setting to find better opportunities and to work in more part-time jobs. And for those movers, for those who moved there, we do not find uh, a big effect, only that they started, so their wage did not move, but they worked less hours. Okay, so they were able to find this. So uh, I'll be very happy to discuss more about these substance requirements afterwards and what we can do and what we can learn with this paper about this specific new regulation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, um, Jean. I certainly would have a few questions um, afterwards. Um, I now pass the floor to Margarita. Uh, so Margarita, you are an economist, a researcher at the Banque de France, and you're going to talk to us about your research on employment effects of um, anti-avoidance rules, French perspective, I believe. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sylvain, uh, for your presentation. All that you mentioned is going to be uh, very useful for you. It's there? Okay, yeah. All that you mentioned is going to be very useful for you to understand uh, what I'm going to present. So uh, uh, this is a joint work with Benjamin Michelet, and it is entitled uh, Employment Effects of a Weakening in European Anti-Tax Avoidance Rules. The, the usual disclosure rules apply here. Uh, these are the views of the authors and not those of the institutions in which uh, we work. So what is the motivation of this paper? Um, we know that uh, uh, despite the increased interest in uh, uh, the implications of uh, tax avoidance and financial opacity, its real effects, and in particular its effects on workers, have been overlooked with a very few exceptions uh, um, in the literature. However, uh, these effects are well known uh, by uh, trade unions and uh, by practitioners. This is something that Severin uh, was mentioning. And for those of you who uh, were yesterday in the Tax Wars uh, uh, film, this is something that Philippe Collin also mentioned from, uh, in the specific case of, of France and General Electric and Alstom. So in this context, the research question that uh, we ask is, uh, what is the effect on French workers of a weakening in the anti-tax avoidance rules in Europe, the so-called controlled foreign company rules, CFC, a shortcut that I'm going to use throughout the presentation, following a decision of the European Court of Justice in 2006 on the Cadbury and Schweppes uh, case. So our departure point is going to be uh, a paper by Sabine Schenkelberg in 2020, where she finds that uh, we're using European firm level data, she finds that profit shifting in European tax havens increased by 10% uh, after the Cadbury and Schweppes ruling. 
So we want to know what are the effects for French workers of this ruling. What says the literature about uh, this relationship? Uh, so we have identified three channels, mainly uh, through which uh, tax haven presence has consequences on employment and wages. The first one is where the bulk of literature is concentrated. Most of the, most of the literature of, on the real effects of tax havens uh, focus on this effect. So uh, the papers that I'm citing are not uh, exhaustive. So uh, indeed, lower, lower taxes translate into a lower cost of capital. So this can increase investment and by this means increase employment and uh, perhaps rent sharing, so increase wages for at least uh, some employees. The second channel is the financial opacity channel in tax havens. So uh, indeed, in this case, uh, uh, artificially reducing uh, profits can allow firms or reduce the profits on which uh, workers can uh, bargain their wages and their uh, rights in general. And in particular, in a country such as France, where we have a strong employment protection regulation, it can allow firms to circumvent uh, this uh, employment regulation uh, employment protection regulation, which can be very expensive for the firm. And finally, uh, Joanne just mentioned that we have the substance requirements. So uh, indeed, uh, where the need to justify a presence in a tax haven can uh, generate uh, employment relocation towards these uh, jurisdictions. So in this context, the contribution of our paper is going to, uh, uh, we're going to provide uh, a causal uh, evidence on how uh, multinationals presence in tax havens affects workers and we're going to uh, assess its heterogeneous impact on the different workers depending on their employment category. We will argue that uh, the channels through which uh, these uh, effects are happening are through the financial opacity channel and the substance requirements channel. So uh, very briefly, let me uh, uh, introduce you the framework in which we study uh, this effect. So first of all, what is the Cadbury and Schweppes ruling? So in this decision, the European Court of Justice decided that uh, the CFC rules, the European, which are national anti-tax avoidance rules, um, infringe the European principle of the freedom of establishment. And that it, this CFC rules can only be invoked in cases of uh, wholly artificial arrangements, which are aimed at uh, circumventing the application of the legislation of a member state, meaning that uh, it restricted the application of the controlled foreign company rules to uh, pure letter boxes. So in order to assess the effect of this ruling uh, on uh, French employees, we uh, uh, mobilized uh, several firm administrative firm level uh, databases in France. We construct a panel of French firms over 2001 and 2014. <laughs> And we uh, use a standard difference and difference in order to assess the average impact uh, over the period of the ruling, meaning our treatment variable, on the treated firms, namely those European firms who were present in a European tax haven before the ruling, before 2006. Here, very briefly, given that we don't have uh, that much time, I'm going to show you the results for the dynamic version of this difference and difference, which uh, is going to allow us to assess, which will, uh, uh, which will allow us to assess uh, the timing of the effect, but most importantly, will reassure us about the causality, the causal relation that we are uh, estimating. So the main result that we find is that uh, for those firms who were affected by uh, the uh, the Cadbury and Schweppes ruling. Uh, employment declined by 6% in the French establishments of this fax. Additionally, th this is what you see uh, in, the, well, in the top. Additionally, these effects were concentrated mostly on high-skilled workers and on white collars, which are mostly administrative workers. And uh, we find a uh, 5% uh, decline for each of these employment categories. Now, based on international trade theory, et cetera, we were also expecting to have an effect on uh, blue collars, lower, uh, low uh, skilled workers. So we don't find any, or we find barely any effect on the whole sample for blue collars. However, when we split the sample, we do find an effect for uh, blue collars in the manufacturing sector. So this is concentrated in the manufacturing sector. And finally, uh, which are the plausible explanations for these results? Uh, I'm very happy that uh, Severine and, uh, and Jan have already explained extensively what uh, the substance requirements are. And also, you also mentioned the opacity channel. So indeed, we do uh, believe that uh, this, uh, these are the two plausible explanations uh, uh, for our results. First of all, indeed, paradoxically, uh, the, the ruling did weak 
the CFC rules, the application of the CFC rules, but it may have strengthened uh, the application of these rules for pure letterboxes. So in these cases, it may have uh, uh, generated relocation of uh, workers towards this jurisdiction. And uh, we believe that, for instance, administrative workers or high-speed workers who, who can work uh, remotely, et cetera, can uh, uh, enter or can, can expand enter uh, in this uh, framework. And the second, and I think which is, uh, I really would like to emphasize this because it's something is, this is a channel that has been so far uh, overlooked by the literature and it is the opacity channel. So beyond the foregone revenues, etc., we have, this is about uh, the rule of law, right? So well, we uh, here the, the idea is that uh, uh, artificially showing that you are in a bad uh, financial condition will allow firms to carry out mass layups. In France, mass layups are, uh, first of all, need to be approved by a judge. So uh, only showing that you are, that you have a, a decline in profits is not enough for the judge to approve uh, this, uh, this mass layup procedure. So this is what you see here, the PSE. This is not part of the School of Economics, it's Plan Sauvegarde de l'Emploi. So this is a legal uh, procedure that needs to be approved by the judge. So we observe an increase in the probability of uh, carrying out a mass layoff procedure. And on the other hand, we observe a decline in sales. So importantly, uh, showing that you have a, a, a decline in profits is not enough in order to, for the judge to approve uh, your, uh, your mass layoff procedure. However, showing that you have a, a sustained decline in sales can, can make it. Finally, what about the cost of capital? I only have two minutes, so I try to go very fast on this. So remember, so lower, lower taxes means lower, uh, lower cost of capital, which means higher investment, right? So we don't observe higher employment. We already saw that we, we have a negative relationship between uh, these two. However, we can also ask, uh, okay, now capital is less, less expensive. Perhaps we're becoming more capital intensive. Do we have a substitution between uh, capital and workers? So to be honest, this is something that we need to investigate yet. However, we believe based on the previous work that I have done on a different setup, but a, a previous paper that I have specifically on the mass layoff procedures, um, would makes, makes us believe uh, that this is not the case. But let's see what happens in this specific case. So to conclude, uh, beyond uh, the foregone uh, uh, tax revenues, Tax haven usage by, by multinationals do have a real effect and can affect workers. So in this paper, we focus on the employment <coughs> effects uh, in France of a weakening of the European anti-tax avoidance rules. We provide a causal evidence on how uh, uh, the Cadbury and Schepp's, Schepp's ruling translated into a 6% decline in uh, employment uh, for uh, French establishments of these firms. And uh, most of the effects are concentrated in uh, um, Quali highly qualified workers and uh, uh, white collars. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Margarita. You all super well disciplined with time. It's fantastic. Um, so I pass now the floor to Camille, Camille Boulanguet, your PhD candidate in economics at the University of Picardy, Jules Verne. And you're going to present your research on the uh, relationship between market power and tax evasion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So um, I'm presenting you uh, and advocating for uh, an expression of the tax issue uh, to competitive concern. So um, tax evasion is a relatively understood concept according to a quantitative uh, study that I conduct using Google Scholar on over 2000, 2000 articles. As you can see on the graph, um, the interest in tax evasion start early 19 with a kind of bounce of this interest in 2008. Uh, probably associating with the global economic and financial context, the subprime crisis. This interest must be related to first, the journal revelation, Wikileaks, for example, and they relieve a complex uh, so, and sometimes illegal financial arrangement. And secondly, economic studies. They show uh, economic consequences of tax evasion and uh, tax optimization. 
we can notice that there is a kind of gap between the estimation of tax evasion and what appear in the economic journals. We can, we can show on the graph on the right, no, on the left, sorry, <laughs> Um, that academic journal publishing on tax evasion or tax avoidance issue often lack a lack of uh, vi international visibility. For example, um, for example, we may be surprised companies that were to be affected by the GAFA tax project in France are most of the time pursued for abuse of po dominant position. So now we are questioning the kind of undeclared link between tax evasion and market power. We can notice that there is a strong undeniability between the two aspects of the issue. On one hand, the movement going from tax evasion to market power, uh, which can be translated in economic world uh, like this, can, can tax evasion be considered as a, a competitive strategy to obtain uh, a market share? And on the other end, the movement going from market power to tax evasion, in other words, do company in a position of market power use tax evasion to maintain a favorable uh, position? So in our presentation, we will discuss of the concept of, um, of the concept on tax optimization and tax fraud. We of course beware of their legal distinction, but uh, we focus on the loss of revenue of their practice represent for the states. So now, sorry. Now, uh, in the second part, uh, I will wonder where the different bases uh, related to this endogenous um, nature of uh, the, nat uh, the endogenous nature of our problem, which is the relationship between tax evasion and market power. So now we are lighting the convergence point between companies which carry out fraudulent or optimizing uh, taxation arrangement and their situation uh, on, um, on, ma on the market. Um, there are, for me, four factors. The first one is the size, uh, the presence of various, in various countries, the, the inversion practices and the use of low, uh, low firm, uh, low firm, uh, low tax firm. Sorry. So the first one is the size factor. As we can see, large multinational companies are mainly involved in tax evasion with a significant pro, uh, portion of profits artificially shifted to uh, tax haven, according to uh, institutional and economy and scientific research. So in fact, uh, international activity allow uh, company to relocate taxes in low or non-existent uh, tax jurisdiction. Moreover, large companies are characterized by their international presence uses subsidiary, and we know that subsidiary are uh, in low tax area facilitate profit shifting via, for example, um, pricing or sale uh, ta uh, tactics. Um, so, inversion practices now. They, we can define inversion practices as um, a practice where, um, uh, where firms are relocated uh, their headquarters to avoid uh, regulation and repatriation taxes. And as we know, the tax law firms represent a, um, a real significant cost for business. And only financially, LC company can afford to um, to this, this specialist. So, um, so um, we know that the academic uh, in the like, academic literature and in the institutional studies they um, converge uh, to um, they converge in highlighting digital sector company 
uh, as those most engaged in profit shifting to tax even. Several hypotheses uh, can be put forward regarding this matter. The first one, of course, is the huge um, multinational company and small monopolistic in nature. The best example is uh, the GAFA. The second hypothesis is, is um, digitalization in more enable company to earn and review abroad without physical presence. In fact, since 90, we noticed that a surge of intra-company in transaction due to the rise of intangi and intangible assets. So, um, sorry, it was here, <laughs> sorry. And so um, now we will see how the tax evasion become an explanation uh, for the increase in market concentration. I choose to, to, to discuss with you of two main articles that we consider emblematic on uh, the issue of increasing uh, market concentration. The first one was, is written by Thomas Philippon, and it, it shows um, that concentration leads to higher prices, reduced investment, productivity, growth, wage, etc. And um, the author uh, show that lobbying and campaign contribution uh, weakening antitrust regulation. In the same way, uh, Longari, Zingales, Posner argue about the same, uh, argue about the same, uh, um, the, the, uh, argue about the decline of U.S. antitrust enforcement, and they come about. Uh, they come to almost the same conclusion. There is a, relax, a kind of relaxation of antitrust enforcement for what big business. So, I'm convinced that to that kind of article influence um, the, the work of Martin Parenti and Tubal proposing uh, 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 works. And they propose that tax avoidance as a factor of increase in market concentration. This paper argues that tax avoidance by large companies um, and large co corporation as a tribute to increase um, the concentration among US uh, firms since the mid 90. Corporate corporation uh, tax avoidance give a large firm a real competition age which translate to into market uh, in market to market share and increase the gran granary of in it, uh, of economy. So um, so now, uh, the very, I think the very question of this, um, this my, paper, my, my paper is the following. To what extent can fraudulent behavior be understood as a reveling tool of unfair competition condition, uh, i.e. as a market capture uh, strategy that operate outside the law? So the rep I think the research objective are the following. So it's to create connection in the world of research, research and taxation, um, between taxation and industrial uh, economics. And to mix uh, empirical research in a real world case, for example, and theoretical research, and provide the economy, um, the economy with a tax kind of taxonomy of tax evasion. Um, and uh, to finish, uh, we can the evolution of, of for example, the functioning of the justice is to um, to to for example to 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 bring a kind of bridge between uh, tax fraud and abuse of position dominant, dominant uh, uh, cases. Uh, and I'm finished here. Merci beaucoup, Camille. And uh, now I pass the floor to Ines as the last speaker of this panel. So, Ines, you're a lecturer in economics at the University of Greenwich. 
and you're going to talk to us about uh, your proposal for a progressive excess, excess profit tax. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for the conference organizers. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about excess profits, and this is joint work with my colleagues Thomas Rabensteiner and Ben Tippett from the University of Greenwich. Um, and uh, keep in mind, this is a proposal for the EU, so there are some features that are EU specific, um, and I'm going to come back to that uh, again and again throughout the presentation. So this is what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today. Uh, what taxes profits? How can we tax them? What does such a tax yield? And then a few discussion points, basically. Uh, so what are excess profits? Well, um, this is just like a motivational figure. Um, in our kind of definition, excess profits have increased recently after the pandemic, after the invasion uh, and the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. We can see that somebody seems to have made a profit, right? Somebody seems to have benefited in some way. Uh, so what are excess profits? Let's come back to this question. Well, we... Uh, are a bit cheeky about that. We say, well, basically, everything that exceeds normal profits is an excess profit, right? Very simple. Uh, and we follow a definition that is uh, put forward by uh, an IMF working paper uh, that you define profits relative to your assets. So every company every year publishes all, a list of all their assets, right? And if your profits exceed 10% of those assets in that year, that's an excess profit, right? We go a bit further than this IMF working paper, actually. We say, well, you know, everything up to 10%, that's normal profits. And then everything between 10 and 15% of your total assets, that's base excess profits. And everything above 15% is super excess profits, right? So that's kind of extreme, very extreme um, profits. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of our very uh, makeshift uh, definition of excess profits. And uh, again, I'm showing you the same figure again. I promise it's the same. And you can see that the increase uh, in excess profits you know, is enormous, but also the increase in super excess profits is enormous. So the reason why we distinguish between the two is kind of to allow for a little bit of uh, progressiveness and progressivity in our tax design, uh, which again, I'll come back to in a second. Uh, because uh, we think that uh, you should tax that progressively. So how can we tax that, right? So again, this is something that we um, developed for the EU and uh, the EU doesn't have the competence to uh, introduce taxes for their member states, right? That's a member state competency. Uh, so what we said is like, let's be pragmatic about that, right? It's not gonna happen that, you know, next week the EU is going to decide, you know, corporate taxation is the same everywhere in all EU countries. That's not going to happen. So what we say is we keep the current uh, corporate taxation, but we in introduce an excess profit tax on top of the current corporate taxation. Okay. Um, so we keep that. We uh, introduce an excess profit tax that is, you know, permanent, meaning that's in uh, opposition to, uh, as opposed to windfall taxes, right? So we've seen windfall taxes, like the EU has had its own, its own kind of windfall tax, even though they refuse to call it windfall tax uh, or tax uh, in general. Uh, we've seen tax windfall taxes elsewhere, uh, all over the world, and they always are ad hoc, right? That something needs to happen, and then you need to see uh, somebody profiteering, benefiting, and then uh, you react. So you're always a bit behind, you're always, um, you know, ill-prepared a, a little bit. So we argue that this should be a permanent thing. Again, we argue that uh, corporate taxation should be progressive, right? Labor income is being taxed progressively uh, all, over the all over the world, and capital income is not, like uh, corporate income is not. Um, and it has been in, in the US until 2017, uh, partly, uh, partially, but uh, yeah, we argue that this should be the case. There, there is a lot, um, there's a lot uh, of debate about why this should or shouldn't be done, um, but we argue it should be. Um, and then kind of a very important feature that tackles uh, a lot of issues that have been discussed today, like tax avoidance, tax, avoidance, tax evasion, is that we, uh, our tax design is destination-based, right? So not your tax on excess profits does not depend on where your company is registered. It depends on where you make your profit. Where do you actually sell your stuff, right? Um, and uh, that's, again, something that we, we didn't come up with that. That's not original at all. Uh, the IMF uh, working paper that I'm citing does that. Uh, EU tax observatory colleagues have done that. Uh, the very uh, harshly uh, talked about uh, OECD pillar one proposes that. So that's, again, not something that is very new. Um, and our tax rate that we propose is basically, remember, everything, all profits are taxed as before, 
right? But on top of that, if your firm makes excess profits, then your base excess profits are taxed at an additional 20%, and your super excess profits are taxed at an additional 40%, right? So that's our idea. So again, this is, you know, to kind of penalize these extreme, extreme profits. Um, this is just, you know, that would be the to uh, total tax bill for the EU. The ICU is kind of the share of sales in the EU to kind of uh, account for this destination-based principle. And, uh, you know, let's just look at what that would yield uh, if you implemented that in the European Union. Just a little disclaimer on our data. So we use farm level data. We have only included farms over an 80 million uh, euro operating uh, turnover uh, threshold. Uh, we are currently working on an extension to include smaller farms and we use OECD country by country reports uh, to kind of estimate where sales are happening, right, in terms of to uh, uh, apply this destination based principle. So, and it's 126 billion euros that you could raise just in 2022 uh, with such a tax, right? It's not massive, it's not, it's never going to be the only source of taxation that we need, but it is. I think considerable, like it's 126 billion euros just in one year. If you look at this over time, you can see that, um, yeah, very unsurprisingly, if your access profits increase, your revenue increases. Um, if you look at the sector distribution over time, you can see that uh, the contribution, uh, the kind contribution of energy firms, for example, increases significantly um, in 2022, for example, but also, you know, other sectors seem to, you know, make a, quite a good profit as well uh, in this period. If you uh, look at where, you know, where are these companies that would now pay excess profit tax in the EU based, you can see that, you know, the United States are kindly contributing quite a lot. Um, that's, for example, Apple. Apple has major excess prof profits in 2022. Uh, but there's also, you know, EU firms that generate excess profits uh, and, you know, have had a very good year in 2022, basically. Uh, let's come to some discussion points. Uh, I am in time. Yes, perfect. Uh, so basically, you know, what are the concerns? Well, always, if you just if, if you present any corporate taxation anywhere, it's, oh, what is going to happen about investment? Right. That's the first question that usually comes to mind. Uh, we argue that uh, investment effects, you know, there, there might be some. Obviously, you know, there's always something. But uh, the good thing about our definition of excess profits is that if you invest something, usually your assets increase. Right. Somehow this, this will change the uh, distribution of your assets. This will kind of ch change the composition of your assets. And that increases your allowance for normal profits. Right. If it's always 10 percent of your total assets and you increase your assets, your allowance increases. Uh, the other thing, obviously, a permanent tax implementation. This is a political discussion. Uh, again, this is as opposed to thank you. Uh, this is as, as opposed to a windfall tax that is ad hoc. And, you know, you never like it's it's also kind of to avoid um, what we call gold plating, like to kind of try to uh, uh, shift around your investments a little bit to make your profits appear a bit, a bit smaller in that year where you know that you will have to pay a windfall tax. Uh, and uh, also like the progressive, uh, I talked about the progressive um, aspect of it, it could raise questions or concerns, that's a debate. Uh, we can discuss this if you like. Uh, and then the other thing, because we propose it for the EU, we propose a unilateral implementation of that, right? So that it's a destination-based approach. So you tax companies that are not registered in the EU. So you tax foreign companies. So again, this is a very political, highly um, controversial question in some, uh, in some uh, regard. But, uh, you know, it's probably okay for many countries uh if there might be you know um not so friendly faces from trading partners such as the united states uh but again this is a political discussion this is not something uh, that is unavoidable or like unsolvable in a way uh again in uh i'm just coming back the destination based approach is something that is proposed by the ocd and i know this um Pillar one has been uh, slammed a bit here, but I think this is a good idea because it's it's one way to deal with tax havens. It's one way to, um, you know, show companies the door um, and say, well, even if you are not registered with us anymore, it doesn't really matter because if you make profit with us, you have to actually pay. 
uh, the other thing is obviously, ideally, in an ideal world, we would want this to be globally coordinated, right? So the UN Tax Convention would be uh, something, uh, so a one place where you could start. But this is something, if you coordinate it globally, obviously it would be more effective. Uh, what about the Global South in that respect? So uh, this, you know, for the Global South, it would be a bit harder to implement that unilaterally. The, for the EU, it's easier because it's like a huge, huge one economic market, right? You can um, say, well, you know, if you want to skip this huge market, you know, you you can, you know, it's, it's harder for you as a company to kind of just... Uh, Go, go and like leave, um, but for the global south maybe it's not as easy. So you'd have to maybe make some adjustments or like also you know come together uh, in like what we had this morning in a regionalist approach and like introduce that uh, in a, in a co coordinated manner. And then the other kind of problem that sometimes uh, that we have to consider is what about industries where you have lots of investments right for many many years. And then you have like a huge profit, like uh, the first thing that comes to mind after the pandemic, especially is like, what, what about pharma companies? What if you invest years and years of research and development into, uh, in, uh, into vaccines, for example? And then, you know, in the one year where you actually um, bring it onto the market, into the market, uh, you make lots of profits. You wouldn't want to penalize these kind of business models. So you'd have to come up with some, we didn't do that in that uh, proposal, but you can come up with some type of tax credit model or like, uh, you know, try to smooth that over time a little bit for uh, companies like this. Yeah, uh, for our future research, uh, I think, I mean, Severin kind of touched on that in her um, introduction initially, you would have to probably come up with a more uh, substantiated uh, definition of excess profits, not the makeshift one we do, you use. And then the big, big uh, discussion that I'm interested in is, what happens with these excess profits, right? Who benefits, like who are the actual owners? I mean unsurprising is probably going to be the top one percent but also you know how can we show that the these uh, excess profits have an actual effect on the wealth distribution and yeah again this kind of tax credit thing would also be something to look into and i thank you so much for your attention thank you very much ines for taking us through um all this um um the design um of an excess profit tax, which you have, you have a way of giving us the impression that it's actually super simple to implement. So <laughs> that's great. So uh, colleagues, we now have um, sufficient time for discussion because the speakers have been uh, remarkably disciplined uh, with their timing. So um, please, uh, could I ask the room to already reflect on some questions and comments that you want to uh, present uh, to this panel? And until you reflect, I have a few questions myself. So perhaps just one round, and then I open the the floor uh, for further discussion. Um, all your presentation had the common point that you all highlighted the different socio-economic impact um, of corporate tax avoidance or tax evasion in some cases. So I think this was very uh, uh, illuminating. I also think that for the purpose of this event, we also need to look ahead and what's next in terms of how do we address some of the perverse effects um, that, that you have highlighted. So that basically is my question, questions uh, uh, to you. Uh, to you, Joan, um, would it be correct in saying that a distinction should perhaps be made between employment in general and employment in the financial sector bubble? Uh, it seems to me, but please confirm, it seems to me that your research focus could focus on employment within the financial sector bubble but it does not necessarily mean where that where you have, for instance, a wage premium, that's going to also benefit the population at large. So can you perhaps elaborate a little bit on that? The reason I'm asking this is because we are in touch with, uh, obviously with comrades in a number of low tax jurisdictions and um, many of them are telling us, actually, we don't really see the benefit. As for the population, we don't really see the benefit of an economic model based entirely on tax incentives. So thank you for the question. Um, so when we look, for example, on the next, uh, on the new uh, global tax evasion report that was presented this morning, um, so they leave us with a list of to-dos and a list of recommendations. And uh, one of them is to strengthen these parts of the last one, I think, is to strengthen the, the need for more, um, for a better evaluation or for a more 
closer look at these uh, requirements that we that exist or these new rules that exist that could be like carve outs for the for the for the minimum tax rates that we are establishing and so on and so forth and i think this is quite important because we need to be able to understand that so in our case study what we try to point out is that um even in a, 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 a jurisdiction that that was um, proposing this type of uh, rules that are now being implemented by other jurisdictions like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we can still see that the implementation went through some loopholes. So th th it was not supposed to, these rules were not supposed to be implemented by allowing just workers to, instead of working in one firm, to sign uh, uh, contracts with multiple firms without so the day has only 24 hours so they cannot be really doing massive value added in many many other many many other firms so we need to be able to understand that how how these rules can be circumvented and then trying to examine so are there are these jobs being created in other places are these jobs being are, are workers really there or are they just registered there and just making these profits uh out of these issues. So we need to be careful with the way that we implement these rules if we, if we want to keep them. If we want to, they, they, they were not, in my opinion, and they were not sufficiently debated through in the public opinion. So they were introduced at the last minute in, in certain rounds. And we need to be careful in how we implement them and, uh, and how we evaluate them and how we, we observe what happens after. Thank you, Jean. I mean, listening to you um, makes me, I remember that um, I believe that Barbados has recently announced how it's going to implement the Pillar 2. And if I remember well, so Barbados is going to apply, like every country, the uh, qualified domestic minimum top-up tax, which allows Barbados as a low tax jurisdictions nonetheless to benefit uh, from a, a very significant increase of revenues from almost a negative corporate tax rate to 15%. And then that money is going to be used in a new inventive type of subvention. So Barbados is going to uh, pay back or reimburse those multinationals for the cost that they incur on employment. Let me be clear, we're not talking about creation of employment in Barbados. We're talking about reimbursement of employment costs for the whole multinational. And that obviously is a great incentive for corporations to continue to book their profits uh, in that uh, tax haven. Um, and let also be clear that from a trade union perspective, that's very problematic because it's money that could be usefully used in the general economy and the real economy, and, and, and it's not, basically. Um, Margarita, um, among the, the several um, explanations that you have um, put forward, um, you know, when you make this, we explain, you know, the correlation between employment levels and, and tax avoidance, you raise the question of opacity. Um, and that is um, extremely interesting for, for many of us. From a worker perspective, we struggle very much to have access to information. We don't really know uh, until we find out it's too late. So um, what type of information do we, do trade unions, do the public need in order to increase their scrutiny uh, on the tax affairs of multinationals? It's okay? There? Okay. Well, thank you, Seren, very much. Um, uh, well, the first thing that I have to say is that uh, this is the second series of a paper uh, uh, where, I've, where I find a very negative effect of uh, tax haven usage on employment. Uh, and I was expecting the opposite. And I was never expecting a negative effect. Uh, so, in again, the literature in this is very scarce. You have a, then I came up with this uh, substance requirement thing, but about the financial opacity and how uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, and how it allows uh, firms to, you know, like uh, to finance uh, uh, mass lay of procedures. Uh, this is something that I came up with uh, by talking with practitioners, actually. So uh, I'm not an expert in this, just <laughs> let me tell you. So this is just a proposal. So then I, st I started digging with a, working more with the data, looking to a specific uh, mass layer of procedures, 
But to be honest, I'm, I'm really not an expert in this. However, yes, indeed, uh, the more I know uh, uh, this, uh, well, this subject, tax, ha tax, haven, on tax havens, I do believe that uh, we focus a lot on, of course, this is very important, but uh, on tax revenues. However, uh, I think that financial capacity is uh, like the big thing in the sense that here we're talking about uh, the rule of law. So uh, yesterday, uh, Eva Jolie was uh, in the film, was uh, mentioned something which was uh, that in tax havens you have uh, rich people, multinationals, and criminals. So uh, of course, uh, this means that something financial opacity allows uh, some people to, uh, uh, yeah, to create distortions between uh, those who uh, uh, have to obey the law and the, those who don't. Now, how to increase uh, 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 transparency, this I leave it to practitioners, I'm uh, just a researcher on this, uh, but, uh, but I do uh, believe that this is, here we're talking about the rule of justice, which is, uh, of course, uh, tax revenues are very important, but uh, I think the big thing is uh, the rule of justice, the, the rule of law, I'm sorry. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sure that you will have colleagues who will want to comment on the type of data that needs to be made public. Um, turning now to, to Ines, um, you, um, sorry, I'm wondering if I'm getting confused with the, with the names. <laughs> um, so on the, on the implementation of, a, of an excess profit tax, um, you've made a case for unilateral implementation for European countries. Um, now, um, I'm wondering um, about the global level cooperation. Um, would you agree that um, a global coordination would possibly strengthen your case for excess profit tax. And then I have a related question to that. Um, you've said that the situation may be more difficult for global South country. And I would like, to, if that's okay, if you could explain a bit more because I'm not fully on, understand the challenges. Um, if you have an excess profit tax that is based on destinations on where the sales are being made, I would intuitively think that it's positive in terms of revenue estimations because it would benefit those countries with large markets. So where do you see the challenges lie for global South country? Okay. Um, yes, definitely uh, do it uh, co in a globally coordinated manner. That's like, that's the ideal world. That's the goal. So that's why, you know, it's perfect for like a conference about the UN tax convention. Um, that's how it should be done uh, globally coordinated uh, for global South countries. So I think, I think it's a kind of a two edged sword in a bit, because basically what you have is if you um, think about uh, the size of a market, right? You have you could have multinationals just saying, well, it's not worth actually, you know, all the hassle trying to sell my products in small, a small uh, development country, right? In a small global south country. Maybe that's not even worth it. And then, you know, uh, you have a reduced choice of uh, imports. So, you know, it, it could ha have like some other effects that you don't want in the first instance. However, if you do it in a coordinated manner with like, you know, smaller regional uh, co cooperation and you try to uh, uh, implement that on a, you know, for example, in, in, in an East African sense that you have a few countries that do it together then obviously you know they can raise more tax revenue this could be used for like useful things uh like i don't know the education of uh, uh school children and um other things right but i think uh it's a bit more tricky whereas the european union right that's the prime candidate for things like that because like it's hard for companies to skip this huge huge market and uh we struggle with tax avoidance in that sense so it would be great to just you know do it unilaterally and uh it's also if you um think about it it's also like a good idea to introduce it unilaterally because it might inspire other countries to you know why would you kind of forego this tax potential if other countries are tapping into that so i think yeah okay thank you so basically um we can uh, chase several cats at the same time yes. um you know looking for progress uh, wherever we can find it, but also it sounds like a good candidate in your view for a topic for a protocol for the UN Convention. Um, and, and Camille, uh, last but not least, um, in your presentation you've highlighted, the, so I don't know if it's a correl correlation or causality, I suspect it's a causality between the comp corporate size of the company um, and tax avoidance. So my question is, um, how do you think tax policies um, can address what seems to be the failures of competition policies? 
Um, thank you. Um, that's a, a very good uh, question, and that's the main issue of my 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 dissertation. Um, um, the question between uh, correlation and causality is very important because uh, in economics, uh, um, causality is very difficult to to show. So I think we can we can talk about just correlation for for the moment. Um, uh, regarding the the, the law, and uh, I think um, there is there are two aspects. The first is um, uh, during the the trivials. Uh, I think the justice uh, should should I don't know which yes should um, make get a kind of gap between uh, the different um, the different. Um, uh, um, uh, trivial cases between tax fraud and uh, uh, abuse of dominant position. For example, uh, last year, in 2003, Amazon uh, has been uh, accused in, uh, of uh, tax uh, fraud. And in the same time, just uh, two months after, of abuse of dominant position. So I think there is a real link and kind of gap that the justice should should uh, should do uh, during um, during um, during the the or the the the, 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 the trays. and um, the second point is uh, when the laws are 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 written, and there are a lot of um, lobby and campaign um, uh, which are um, um, how can I. Speak? Um, a lot of campaign who um, financed by big company, which um, are um, pro uh, relaxing uh, tax and, uh, antitrust enforcement. So that that's uh, a very point. And those uh, firms are the same, which are accused of tax uh, tax fraud. And that's very important to. Uh, to to do the link between uh, the, the 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 two aspects, and uh, when the when um, and to be more transparent in a lobby campaign, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have uh, some time for questions and comments in the room. So please don't be shy. Raise your hands. Yeah, can I? So over there, and can I ask you to quickly introduce yourself first? Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Orr. I work for Public Services International, which represents public service trade unions around the world. And I also work for the Center for International Corporate Tax Accountability and Research, SICTAR, which some of you may know. Um, thank you very much uh, for the really fascinating contributions for really um i have two questions one is for everybody which is that you all touched in one way or another about the the lack of understanding i think you're all economists no the lack of understanding i'm not an economist you can probably tell um the lack of understanding that seems to be in the field between or the lack of evidence between the link between tax avoidance and other corporate bad practice, whether that be um, offshoring employment, whether that be paying low wages. Um, this is an issue as trade unions that we come up against in the tax space all of the time. I mean, we had this uh, trade union tax forum in Berlin a few months ago, and uh, a representative of the German finance ministry who will remain nameless seemed to genuinely not understand why she was being asked questions about tax avoidance by trade unions. So my question for you is, why are these, in your field as economists, and more generally, why are these linkages so little understood? Is it because they're not taught in places like this? Or is it because they've just not been studied? Or is it because certain people in the field, or particularly people in the field who work in finance ministries don't want to see the linkages? Like, because it is very obvious from us for the trade union side that there is very little awareness about how corporate, bad corporate behavior in the tax space has a knock-on effect in terms of bad corporate behavior, in terms of how they treat their workers, about where employment's located, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, my second uh, question is specifically for Ines. Um, it was a fascinating um, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, why could I... So two quick questions. How do you... Have you looked about dealing... When you're measuring assets, how are you going to deal with intellectual property? Because I can see there there's already a, a potentially for big tech firms particularly, and also pharma, which you mentioned, there's going to be a big issue there about uh, dealing with intellectual property. And why the choice of a sales-only formula? Um, I know this has been controversial elsewhere. We, we have issues with it in the trade union movement, sales-only formula, because in your EU case, you can specifically imagine circumstances whereby, say, a company in Germany manufactures a lot of cars in Slovakia but sells a lot of them in Germany, and Germany gets all the tax base and Slovakia doesn't get any of it. And that's without even thinking about in terms of global north and global south. And that not only seems unfair but causes political issues about getting these things through. The Slovakian government, therefore, has no uh, you know, motivation to support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We're going to take two or three questions, if that's okay. Okay, so I've got now. Hi, Maria Romalcera from the Center for Economic and Social Rights. A quick reminder and a quick question. The reminder is to, to try to avoid the temptation to always represent tax havens as Caribbean islands, or because we know that most of the tax abuse actually happen with like really gray clouds, cloud skies, more like city of London, Delaware, you know, Luxembourg, all of those. That's the quick reminder. And the question is more for Ines. Again, fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think I missed how you calculate what normal profits are. And also, when you were talking about destination-based approach, could you unpack that a little bit and how, how you would be able to calculate, again, those excess profits where the money is being made, as, so all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. I'm, just, I'm going to take a third question, but just to come back on this uh, tax havens uh, caricature of Palm Island, I, I mean, I know, and there is a lot of... Uh, annoyance uh, from comrades in the said uh, Palm Islands who feel that the, the finger is pointing at them very unfairly. I, I, I feel the need to say, however, I'm, I'm probably disclosing trade union business here, but never mind. I feel the need to say that when we engaged with trade unions in tax havens in general, the most positive response I get for the moment is from those Caribbean and smaller, comparatively smaller islands, not just in the Caribbean. They are the ones who right now are extremely interested in developing an alternative economic model, and they are the ones, as John has just presented very well, they're saying it does not work for us. That economic model does not work. So that is a clear message, I think, of this panel. I just wanted to clarify that. So I have one third question there, and then we go back to the moderator. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Marlene Apostolido, and I teach tax law for the last 15 years of my life. So one quick question I was wondering, since Cadbury's Schubert case law, we had in 2015 ATAD that did introduce CFC rules in the whole Europe. Have you seen any changes in your numbers? We are like eight years after, and that was PEPS Action 4. Because you defended the case that... Uh, because of that uh, case law, we had more tax avoidance. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Should we go for a quick round of response? Um, Ines, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, I'll try to make it quick. So intellectual property, uh, I'll leave the linkages to you, okay. Um, <laughs> um, intellectual property, uh, so obviously, uh, if it's not on your uh, balance sheet, it's not going to increase your allowance, right? That's kind of by definition how we defined it. Uh, I think what you can do if you want, it, like if you obviously, this is like a very rough uh, proposal that we did. What you can do is you can introduce like, uh, I don't know, virtual assets, if you will, like that intellectual property is, you know, assessed somehow. Um, because, you know, firms do that in a way anyway, like if they invest in intellectual property, they have to kind of make sure is it worth their investment, right? They uh, expect some type of return. And then obviously you can uh, uh, include that. The way we try, uh, the reason why we use the sales only approach is um, 
because it's uh, easily accessible data for the authorities, right? So um, you can obviously uh, come up with like some formula, some mix of uh, what measures you are trying to use to, you know, um, make out your destination, or like to kind of come up with your destination uh, share, if you will. But uh, you know, if you are a German tax authority in your example, you know how many cars are being sold uh, in Germany because you they pay VAT and they pay other taxes for that. And uh, that's like easily accessible, uh, accessible information for you. So that's the very pragmatic reason. And then the other question was um, normal profits. Okay, are you, uh, sorry, Marian, was your question about how we define that or why we come up with that definition or what? How? Okay, so it's uh, from all your assets, it's 10% of your assets is your normal profit allowance, right? So every year, that's a really, really, that's really high. If you look at actual profit rates of firms, that's a really, really high rate. You can make up to 10% of your total assets every single year with the normal tax rate. And then just if you go over that, are you, you know, liable for excess profit taxes? That's kind of our definition. Um, Again, if you look at historical examples, historical windfall taxes, uh, excess profit tax examples, they were more in, in the region of like 6%, 7%, 8%, right? So we are really generous with this. Um, yeah, and the destination-based approach again. Um, so basically the idea is that currently in corporate taxation, wherever you are registered is kind of where your profits are taxed. So if I am a German company um, and I sell stuff in the UK, in Romania and in Germany, I am being taxed in Germany, right? And the destination-based uh, approach would kind of, uh, again, depending on whether you uh, make it, uh, you make it depend on sales or whatever other um, uh, characteristic, you tax your profits where they are being generated, not necessarily where you are being registered. Uh, and this kind of tr is a one way to deal with tax avoidance because if you, you know, register your company instead of Germany, which is a high uh, income, uh, high corporate tax uh, country in the Cayman Islands, then uh, your uh, tax burden is completely different, right? And then if, but if you still keep on selling your products in Germany, you will still be liable for excess profit tax in Germany. That's the idea. Is that clearer? Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, about uh, the why uh, do we have uh, uh, so few uh, papers on the effects on workers? I think this was your question. Uh, I really, uh, generally, I think that it is just uh, that uh, it didn't exist and it's really coming out. Now, today, like when I started the first uh, time that I, that I came up with this uh, result was uh, 2020. And again, like in the literature, there was nothing on that. So I turned to practitioners and uh, I kind of understood what was happening. And uh, just to say something, you know, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, a previous paper on the same thing has already been rejected uh, in a journal just because I go against the literature. So this financial capacity things, I mean, it's really so far not there in the literature, but it is coming tomorrow. Uh, Ron Davis here in front of me will have a, a presentation on the same issue. Say, same issue. So, uh, and you have more and more papers coming on this. So, uh, I, uh, so I do believe that it's just that. We didn't know about it again. Exactly. I would just like to add uh, first, maybe a point taken. I think that's very important to say. And there's a, an, an amazing body of literature coming out right now. I, I'm not a part of the EU Tax Observatory, unfortunately, but they are doing an amazing job to try to point out with the uh, trying to bring the gap, to close the gap with this little awareness. I think that. Part of that uh, work is still very recent. Um, part is not published yet, but I think we are learning more and more about it. So I, I see that with a, a little bit of optimism. Thank you. Okay, we have a second round of questions. Please raise your hands. One, two, three. The one on the left side, four. Four and a half, maybe. Okay, we start over there. Sarah Hall from uh, Tech Justice UK. Um, I, it's just a quick suggestion because I, I noticed the uh, uh, use of the term uh, tax burden. We, um, in the tax justice movement in the UK, we've made a new rule. So anyone who uses the term 
tax burden has to make a donation to Tax Justice UK, but as we are a global forum, maybe we can make a donation to the global um, tax justice movement if we use a tax burden. Just a suggestion. Sorry, not a question, but thought I'd bring in some lightheartedness with a serious point. Did you, I, I assume you took notes of how many times we used that term. Okay. All right, I have three raised hands here. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Camilo Lozano. I am an economist and I've worked as a transfer pricing consultant for over the last 20 years. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. This has been like very enlightening. Uh, my question is uh, directly for Ines. I would like to know if uh, like we work under the premise that there are structural differences between sectors when it comes to profits. So if I wanted to ask you if you consider that having a differential XX rate uh, uh, according to sectors would help to implement, uh, implement it better even uh, and, uh, and coming from, from uh, as a member of a global south, like if it would help uh, to implement it there like recognizing that there are some capital investments that have to re um, like regain the, 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 the investment, in fact. So thank you. Next question here at the, at the front. Thanks very much, Hassan Damluji, um, co-founder of Global Nation, also a visiting fellow at LSE. Uh, really enjoyed all of the papers and the discussion. Thanks so much. Um, I, I wanted to come to uh, Ines's proposal. R really liked it <laughs> because it was very propositional. I think that's why you're getting a lot of reaction. Um, <clears throat> I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, there are industries where uh, the assets are quite low because the real assets, but they're not counted as that, is the people, right? And so, you know, in professional services where you have a bunch of people with laptops, uh, making quite a lot of profits, um, which is, you know, I'm not saying that shouldn't be taxed, but I was quite interested in your point that uh, you're trying to actually incentivize investment, right? Because then if you increase your assets, okay, but then you, there's a risk that you're de uh, disincentivizing employment because actually it helps me to automate. And I'm not saying country companies shouldn't automate, but you're creating a strong incentive, right? To have physical assets rather than people. And I wondered whether to get around both of these problems, the disincentive and the fact that some companies are quite different, is if you take into account both employment and assets in a formula, then either I employ more people or I invest, and either way I can uh, reduce my tax burden, or frankly, I pay more tax because I have neither the people nor the assets, and then really it's excess profit. So I was just thinking about t taking employment into account. Thanks. Thank you very much. So there's one question here, but I... Wasn't there one yet, the gentleman behind you? Thank you for letting me jump the queue. Uh, did you do that? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was scratching my head before. Uh, Paul Monaghan, Fair Tax Foundation. Love whether it's a windfall tax or it's an excess profit charge, whatever you want to call it. But I think it's interesting that how, how do we make sure that it's not all industries being treated the same? So let's say in the energy sector, you've got fossil fuel investments in the North Sea and you've got offshore wind farms in the North Sea. How do we make sure that you don't get the ridiculous situation like in the UK where initially you had a tax relief against the excess profit charge if it was in fossil fuels but not renewables? Unless the renewables were on the oil rig. You got a tax relief if, the, if there was a solar panel on, on the oil rig. You look at somewhere like Spain, which has just adjusted its excess, excess profits levy because... Again, it was going to disincentivize renewables over fossil fuels. And my understanding is the second version of the excess profit levy in Spain actually grants tax reliefs for renewables investment. So how do we make sure that these proposals dovetail with the low energy transition that we all want and don't clash in their indifferent silos? Thank you. So we are approaching the, the end of the panel. So um, I'm just going to take two more questions. Uh, there's one here, and Dominique uh, as the last word. So please, yeah, the very front. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Stephen Hall. I'm part of the GRADE project that you heard about in the last session. Um, what I'd like to ask about is that all of these papers seem to be implicitly assuming that there's just one 
player in this game, one policymaker setting tax rates under different regimes. But actually, all these multinational companies have very well-paid accountants who are design, sitting there designing the way they, they structure their whole accounts uh, so as to avoid exactly what you're trying to do. So th this analysis really has to be done in a game context where you allow for both uh, what policy re regime you set up, but then also how that these companies are going to react to those regimes. And that's, uh, you know, essentially they're, they're very clever these people, they get paid a lot more than we do <laughs> to design exactly the right way to respond uh, to the regimes that you're trying to set up. Okay, thank you. And then Dominic? Yes, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I'm Dominic Gross from Allianz Sud in Switzerland, and I'm actually also a member of the union in Switzerland, which is a member of PSI uh, on the international level. Um, yeah, my question, I, I think, goes to Joao about, I mean, do you have any data on the distributional effects um, inside tax havens or inside low tax jurisdictions uh, in the sense who is profiting of it or benefiting of a low tax regime and who is not inside the society? I mean, what we see in Switzerland, for example, in the canton of Zug, which is one of the most famous or infamous tax havens, is actually that even the, the upper middle class can't afford housing anymore there because you see as, as lower the tax, especially the, in this case, the, the, the income tax, the personal in, income tax, uh, housing rents are going up, right? Uh, so there is, there is kind of a displacement from Zug to other cantons in regard to this. And we were looking, or we are looking for a long time uh, for studies uh, looking into distributional effects there. It would be also politically highly relevant because obviously if the, is the, if the distribution effects are negative uh, uh, from a perspective of the average people, it would lower the acceptance uh, of such uh, tax models. Uh, yeah, I think quite, quite impressively. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. So, um, my dear panelists, it's now the final round. So, could you please answer the question and at the same time as make your final remarks? Um, Ines, you got bombarded with questions. Uh, <laughs> excess profit is definitely yeah. a sexy topic. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, okay, sectors, right? So that kind of comes into play with the renewables, uh, fossil fuel question as well. Because I mean, basically, the idea was if you have um, excess profits then they should kind of be treated equally everywhere right what you can do and maybe what should is something that you sh we should think about it like we i should build into my proposal probably is how can we make sure that socially useful um activities are kind of rewarded and like socially not so useful and everything else is not as rewarded right so that that would be kind of the the thing and i think the easiest way to do that again is like to do some kind of allowance to, to to do some kind of tax credit for like i don't know if you have um something that is socially useful you should get like an extra tax credit for that uh and that obviously you know it's not as straightforward as saying well you are in energy and then you you, you also do renewables so um basically we you know exempt you from every excess profit tax. Uh, but uh, the other thing, like in terms of sectors, so there are different sectoral uh, profit rates, obviously, right? Uh, but I do believe that 10% is so extremely high that uh, you don't need to adjust it according to sector. What you, again, what, I, what you do need to do is kind of, you, make, you need to make sure that uh, socially useful uh, activities are not penalized um the other oh employment right so we uh, actually when we looked at the data we were like oh my god are we just going to tax financial um financial companies right are we only going because they you know usually they have like a few computers and a few people and that's it uh, is that our main um uh tax contributor the financial industry and for some reason not at all uh so I think, um, I mean, not for some reason, but <laughs> so the, the reason being is that uh, even though you have very little physical capital, these financialized companies have so many things on their balance sheets that they, you know, increase their assets and in inflate their assets. So one thing that I didn't discuss, which I can 
for one minute, <laughs> just touch upon is the uh, negative incentive uh, incentive that you would set with such a, you know, you increase your assets, you increase your tax allowance, is that you can invest into like, sorry, can I swear? Bullshit assets. Um, so uh, if you invest, I don't know, if you see as a company, you know, you, you, you anticipate, oh my God, I'm just going to make it over the 10% uh, threshold. I buy a private chat for my company director because, you know, why not? And also it's going to exempt us from the excess profit tax. So this is kind of something where I'm not, I'm st we're still discussing that internally. Uh, I'm still not super convinced that this is uh, easily avoided. I think you'd have to uh, include some some type of um, cutoff date in the years, in the tax year or something to avoid, you know, companies panicking and being like, okay, let's buy just 10 more new SUVs for our executives, right? Um, is that all? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If accountants and international ta tax avoidance, yeah, of course, uh, there's me people much smarter than me, definitely, that uh, only do as their job to avoid taxes all day long. Uh, but the thing is, politically, we have to do something, right? So uh, destination based approaches is one way to do that. Uh, it's not the best, the only way, but I think that's one way we can address this. Thank you very much. Uh, just one thing, I think that I, there was a question for me on CFC rules that uh, in the first round that was left to mention from the back, you're a legal practitioner. Uh, a, well, our, it was a strengthening in the CFC rules in 2015, right? That's what you mentioned. Yeah, well, I thank you for the idea. <laughs> But uh, so uh, that would be nice to see uh, what's happening. But uh, our uh, period of study is uh, 2001 to 2014. So uh, the, the year before that. But uh, just uh, really happy to discuss more about it to see what's happening in the data. Thank you. Joe? Um, just a brief remark. Well, point taken about the well paid accountants and their effects. So what we see when the substance requirements were introduced is that immediately like one third of the firms that were there they immediately disappear and these things are super important when we try to discuss uh, the effects of these of any any public policy in 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 in, in case um, then do you have any additional data on the distributional effects we try to be very careful trying to say so who benefits from this and that's why we show that uh, part of the profits created by these new rules are, are taken by those that are already there working. So they have better networks, they have better information, so they know what are the opportunities that are, that are opening up and what they can do to grab these better opportunities. We, we find that their wages increase. And at the same time, they still need more workers and they, they attract uh, people who move to... to to, to this jurisdiction, and these people, they don't seem to be get, so they, they be benefit, but they don't get paid above premium in the market for their jobs. So they work a little bit less, that's what they get, but not a huge increase in their wage. So that's, so there are some, so the, the, the benefit seems to be most concentrated on those that really uh, are there and they take advantage of, the, of having more information. I'm very obsessed about this question about the welfare. And um, so in my research, I'm trying to study not corporate income tax, but things like golden visas and real estate markets or tax credits for non-residents that uh, to attract highly educated people to a country. And um, so it's a f I'm, we are trying to do more work on that. So we try to see that, yes, there's a cost in terms of personal income tax. But at the same time, they also consume a lot. They also create spillovers for in the economy. Um, they buy, they pay other types of taxes like VAT, transaction tax data. On the other hand, they also create like housing affordability crisis in many many contexts. So yes, that's we'll try to to contribute to these discussions in the future. Thank you very much, Owen. We're looking forward to it. Okay, so we have now uh, reached the end of our time, slightly exceeded it, but it's entirely my fault, not the speakers. Um, so um, I think one of the objectives of this panel was to put forward potential um, solutions uh, for the UN, for new international tax governance under the UN auspices. So here, here what I've uh, noted in terms of main suggestions. First of all, there is a clear need for global coordination 
on tax matters. So um, um, there are a number, the, the UN is a very, uh, I think very relevant to address several of the, if not all of the social economic effects that have been described by the participants um, here. Now, in terms of substantive solutions, transparency was raised on several occasions, whether it's uh, beneficial ownership or it's whether um, how much and where our corporations um, are paying. So transparency perhaps can be one topic for a substantive protocol for the UN Convention that we're discussing. Um, another thing, nobody, I'm surprised, nobody has used the words transfer pricing. Transfer pricing. But it's everywhere, I think, isn't it? And when we talk about manipulation, when we talk about very well-paid accountant, when we talk about loopholes, that's what it is. It's a manipulation of transfer pricing rules. So, um, yeah, clearly, uh, revision, if not eradication of transfer pricing rules will are more than necessary, and we're certainly hoping that from the uh, UN uh, progress. And then we also talk about taxing um, uh, economic rents and the excess profit tax. This clearly was the sexiest topic of this panel. So why not adding that on the list of things to do uh, for the UN as well? So not too big, dig not a Christmas shopping list. I think these are very fairly reasonable demands, but something tells me that there is a lot of work ahead of us. And I just want to conclude by that. You, sir, you've mentioned you've raised the problem of well-paid and very clever accountants. Right, they may be better paid than us, but they are nowhere, nowhere as well engaged as we are on those issues. And that's why we will take things forward. Thank you.